You need to know it in any case. Again, often referred to as the Varna. Now, we need to understand the religious geography of the Indian subcontinent if you want to understand the political geography of the subcontinent. All right? Because it's fundamental. Some observations that you want to take note of. In the 6th century BC, in the northeast, a certain aristocratic prince named Siddhartha Gautama, at the age of 29, voluntarily surrendered his kingdom, if you would, and wandered the forest for what, approximately six years, experimenting with various forms of religious meditation. When he emerged, he claimed himself to be the Buddha, as you can see here, meaning the enlightened one, and thus you know where Buddhism starts, if you would. In fact, you can see by this map here, all right, you can see the Indian subcontinent, you've got the Hindu core of India running along the Ganges, which we'll talk about soon enough, but you can see over here that Buddhism roughly starts in this portion of the Indian subcontinent in the 6th century BC. Now, when you look at a map of India today, in fact, let me go back to this map here. If I was to say, look, is the, you know, uh, turn to uh, page X in the atlas, what you would see is that Buddhism largely, not completely, I'll give you some examples in a minute, but Buddhism has largely been displaced from this location in the Indian subcontinent, largely. And if you were to look in the in where in the world uh, Buddhism predominates, it's further to the east, all right, southeast Asia, East Asia, Buddhism predominates now, but in its core zone, it has largely been displaced. And if I was to ask you on a test, which I will, what displaced Buddhism from its core zone? The answer is, as you can see here, the rise of Islam. This is a map of the Middle East showing the spread of Islam. I've circled Mecca here, and what you can see here is that uh, in the early 7th century, AD, the prophet Muhammad, uh, if you would, uh, rises to power. He was a Meccan. In fact, he had been, if you would, exiled. He manages to take over the city, ultimately, of Mecca, and, if you would, starts the religion that we know today as Islam. All right. And you can see how Islam quickly spread from its core zone, which is Mecca and Medina. Are actually these two cities here, but Mecca is, is considered the spiritual core point, if you would, for the religion. And you can see it spread quickly across North Africa. Um, I could talk why that spread happened so quickly, having to do with physical geography and other factors. Let's not worry about that now. Suffice to say that if Islam was spreading in this particular physical environment that has low population densities because these are very arid zones. All right. What you would expect when you compared it with a spread of another religion where you have high population densities, let's say Europe, if you would, where people are living much closer together, if each one was spreading at the same rate, let's say one per week, let's just make up a number, you would expect the spread to be more rapid in North Africa and the Middle East because the area is drier, which means the population densities are lower, which means people are living further apart. And so tra uh, conversion rates being the same, let's make that up, all right, what you're going to get is a rapid spread over these lightly populated areas. Within 100 years of its founding, Islam is knocking on the door of the Iberian Peninsula, if you would, in Spain. It spreads rather rapidly. But the key observation you want to make here is that Islam spreads, and of course, it, as you can see here, enters into the subcontinent. All right, Islam, 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 it comes into the subcontinent, in the 10th century AD, it impacts that massive Hindu population core, had very little success converting it directly. Again, we won't address the reasons for that here now. Let's just look at the geography of it. 
uh, Islam comes out the other end and displaced Buddhism from its core zone. Therefore, the observation that you want to take note of is that Buddhism has been displaced from its core zone by the entry of Islam in the 10th century AD, a thousand years ago. All right. Now, I said that Buddhism has been displaced from its core zone. This is largely the truth, with an interesting exception. There's always an exception to every rule. All right. Bangladesh here is Islamic, predominantly. All right. But there is a country in the region where Buddhism still predominates as the majority religion. That country is this country here called Bhutan, which is backed up right against the Himalaya Mountains. On the southern slope of the Himalayas here, Buddhism is the official religion. All right. So Bhutan is the principal expression of Buddhism, remaining relatively near Buddhism's hearth region. And by the way, since we're here, we have the Himalaya Mountains running right over here. Since we're here, Let's look at the country of Nepal, which is uh, almost next door. The Nepalese, by the way, were originally Buddhists, but are now overwhelmingly Hindus. Now, here we have an image of the southern flank of the Himalayas. And uh, this is essentially is, uh, I will, I'm circling here with the cursor. This is essentially Nepal, all right? You have the Tibetan Plateau, which is China. Now, although that's a debatable issue with some, let us just go with that being called China today. And we have India below. But we have Nepal here on the southern flank, if you would, of the Himalaya Mountains. And of course, this is a geography class, so you have to take uh, notice of, of fundamentally important and high-profile geographical features, and that is that Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, is located here uh, almost directly, well, in, essentially on the border between uh, Nepal and uh, the Tibetan Plateau in China. You can see Mount Everest there uh, with what's about uh, 29,028 feet, I believe, or so, in any case. Uh, you can see this image here. This is uh, uh, Mount Everest here. The southern flank is in Nepal. And again, that's the highest point uh, in the world. This has become quite a tourist attraction, if you would, especially for those suffering from that informal malady called uh, well, like the emotional problems of the first world. If you would, looking for a certain amount of purpose and accomplishment, people often come to, well, some people come to Nepal uh, to Mount Everest to climb the highest mountain and have a sense of accomplishment in your life in any case. I believe uh, you can understand how Nepal is going to foster this uh, or promote this activity. It represents, if you would, hard currency, Western hard currency and underdeveloped economies, especially when they've been charging somewhere in the neighborhood. You can get a guide to try to take you up here somewhere between fifty-five and seventy thousand dollars, something like that. In any case, it's pretty expensive, so you can see not everybody can afford that. If you can afford that, well, that's impressive. The observation you might want to make here is that the average person is probably not suited to try to make this ascent. All right, this climb is particularly dangerous, and you have to be in physical condition. Not everybody is capable of doing so, in any case. So the very fact that it's turned into a commercial opportunity is tragic because there are many deaths which have resulted from people irresponsibly trying to get up this mountain with tours that should not have taken place. In fact, the mountain is fairly well littered with bodies because once you die up here, nobody's going to whisk their own life trying to bring you down in any case. Oh, it's a picture of a base camp. All right. Um, in any case. I could put images up there. I would leave, ask you to go ahead and type into the web uh, images uh, in uh, Google Images of uh, Mount Everest crowded, and you'll see some pictures which are astonishing of lines and lines of people trying to get through a, a window of opportunity when the weather permits to get up here. All right. 
who cannot be up in this zone very long because there's insufficient oxygen, your body is dying. All right, you gotta try to get to the top, get your picture and get down. All right, unfortunately, there are many who do not. All right, and of course, if you die and you get integrated into one of the ice sheets coming down, your body gets snapped apart. The body parts have popped up at base camps uh, periodically, as is suggested by this image, of course. You know, and, and if you can just tell by the styling, that's some, bo some boot probably from the 60s or 50s. In any case, and somebody was, uh, if you would, interred in ice for that period of time and has now emerged. A bit macabre, but there you have it, in any case. In Nepal, lest I ask you that question with the world's tallest mountain is. All right. We'll not worry about the Chinese half for the moment. The Chinese are also promoting more tourism to their access, although it's a harder access. Another matter, in any case. Okay. Now, there's another group you want to take note of. We have, as you can see by this image here, an Islamic wing to the northwest. We have a Hindu core, and we have an Islamic wing to the east. Now, between the northwestern Muslim population and the Hindu core, there is emerged another uh, religion called the Sikh religion. We often say Sikh here. I believe the pronunciation is Sikh, all right? But we tend to say Sikh, all right? And the Sikh religion has emerged in this transition zone between Hindu, Hinduism and Islam approximately 500 years ago. It is based in the Punjab state of India, although the Punjab state really extends into the neighboring state of Pakistan over here as well. The observation you want to make is sort of geographic, a geographic translation of this, that, uh, that the Sikh religion is a, uh, if you would, uh, a compromise between Hinduism and Islam. It's a fusing of both these religions. It was an attempt to fuse the, to these two contentious religions of Hinduism and Islam. Let me go through uh, some of the differences or, or the uh, features that fuses together these two religions within the Sikh tradition. All right, and by the way, there's a term you need to know that goes with this. All right, this is because you will see others. Uh, you can see the Sikhs here. In London, the, are the population we often associate it imperfectly with those who for the males who wear turbans. All right, a lot of uh, individuals in the West often associate that with Islam. That's a mistake. All right, that has to do with the Sikh religion, and the Sikhs have had a contentious relationship with Islam, to say the least. Now, there's a term you need to know, and that's called the syncretic religion. There you have it. A religion that is a blending of two or more existing belief systems is a syncretic religion. All right, that's a formal definition. Good to know it. I tend to ask you that question. Now, in reality, speaking less than formally with you, all religions are syncretic, coming from previous belief systems. But that's a contentious point which causes people to get upset. Everybody likes to believe that their particular belief structure stems from some primordial, primordial groin of some sort and is pure by its creation. Well, wishful thinking. In any case, know what a syncretic religion is. The Sikh religion is a syncretic religion. Let me give you some examples of the Sikh religion that fuses both these two religions. All right? I don't have a graphic text for this, but you can take this down. First off, the Sikhs reject in his, uh, they reject the the the, uh, the caste system within Hinduism. If you are a Sikh, you can transcend your social position through the accumulation of wealth. You can consider that a class system, not a caste system. All right, so there is no stifling caste system within the Sikh tradition. The Sikhs reject idolatry. All right. Idolatry is the, essentially, the, the worshiping of physical manifestations of the divine, all right? An idolater has made a physical molding or manifestation of the divine and often worships that feature, all right? Uh, Hindu, Hinduism has 
plenty of idolatry. See all kinds of images of divine uh, entities. All right. Technically, Christianity does not approve of idolatry. I say technically because we know that Christians like to make crosses. And that's a representation, or at least it's emotionally responded to as a representation of the divine. Nevertheless, technically Christianity does not allow idolatry. You're not supposed to be doing this. The Sikhs also rejected in Hinduism the multiple gods. Sikhs are monotheists, in effect. All right. Let me tell you some things that the Sikhs rejected in Islam. The Sikhs rejected the crusading character of Islam. All right, Islam, much like Christianity, is a universalizing religion where people uh, actively try to expand the religion. This could be done peacefully, historically, often not peacefully. Nevertheless, it's a universalizing, Islam is a universalizing religion. The Sikhs do not actively seek, if you would, converts in any case. So it is not universalizing. And you might understand if you're in this portion of the world and Islam has just entered and bringing with it, uh, if you would, uh, by the presence of an opposition to Hinduism, conflict, you can understand how people might not like the notion of proselytizing or religious imperialism. Call it what you like. All right. The Sikhs also reject in Islam the need to have a pilgrimage. If you are a Muslim, you should make a pilgrimage, often referred to as the Hajj, H-A-J-J. -J. You're supposed to make a pilgrimage at least once in your life. More often, you can afford to do so. A pilgrimage back to Mecca, sort of spiritual reorientation, if you would, an act of purification, if you would. The Sikhs reject that. By the way, Hinduism also has a pilgrimage often referred to as the Tirtha, which you're supposed to go to the Ganges and purify yourselves. The Sikhs reject that as well. All right? So an overview of the Indian subcontinent from the 10th century on is just as you can see here. You have a, the Hindu core, that massive Hindu population, you have a Muslim population to the northeast and a Muslim population to the northwest. You have a transitional religion, no insult at all to Sikhs there, but a historically new religion, it's 500 years old, based in Punjab state called the Sikh religion. There's some terms you want to know from the text. They are, as you can see, centrifugal force. And what you're going to see is that a religion has been religion has been a centrifugal force on the subcontinent. A centrifugal force is a force that disrupts the internal order of the state and promotes disunity. You'll see the implications of the expression of that momentarily when I go and show you the centrifugal effects of religion on the subcontinent. But know this definition, you'll find it in the text. All right. And since we have the definition for centrifugal force, let's go ahead and put the definition or centripetal force over there. That's a force that promotes national unity and solidarity. I'll give you some examples, I believe, as we move along here. Good definitions to know. They're in your text. All right. Now, as I've done in the Asia and the uh, African subcontinent, let's look at the effect of European colonialism here because it plays an important role when you look at modern India as well, in any case. As you can see here, this map, you can see the imperial presence of the Europeans right at the end of the 18th century. This map showing you 1780, and you can see not unlike not unlike you found in Africa up until the late 19th century, the Europeans were located primarily on the edge of the continent. You can see the Portuguese, the French, the British over here, and. It's, it's not unfair to say that the principal economic opportunities that the Europeans were harvesting were in the far, farther east and southeast Asia, not here in the subcontinent. It wasn't a major point of investment for them, and so they stayed primarily on the coasts. All right. 
you don't have the same physical geographical factors which were impediments in sub-Saharan Africa, but nevertheless, the observation you want to make is they did not absorb the great interior.